As it turns out, his new wife is lacking in neither class nor character, and Trump, a new father aged 60, seemed caught off guard by the new family setup. Yeah, you will have lunch and then you go to school. Now I'm going to go. Yeah, first you will have lunch and then you go to school. So he's had three wives. He's never been close to any of them. He's never shared a bedroom with any of them. Uh, he, he essentially has lived apart from his wives, even within the marriages. Mommy, can I bring this to school? No. He has led a very solitary, lonely life. And uh, he has few, if any, friends. Uh, he really has very few people he can talk to. And so he is uh, sort of desperate for those kinds of connections. Washington always ignored Donald Trump, who was too mouthy and too corrupt, therefore dangerous. And yet, Trump had always taken an interest in Washington, at least when it coincided with his own interests. When Donald Trump ran for president in the 2016 election, it was the sixth time, that is six times, <laughs> that he had talked about running for president. So it wasn't a brand new idea. But what did he really know about the Republican heritage of the Founding Fathers, Lincoln's message, and the values of democracy? And he's never changed in any way. I was asking him about uh, something he'd done in his 20s and how it had changed his life. And he said, no, 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 you got me all wrong. He said, I haven't changed in any significant way since I was seven years old. And he has that much insight into himself to realize that he really is unchanged. What's more, one of Trump's strengths is his puerile affinity. He always feels at ease and happy around children. And thank you for coming here. It's really nice. And enjoy your Christmas and enjoy your Hanukkah and enjoy everything. We're going to have a good time. Go sing another song. There's no brutal competition with children, only the mysterious nostalgia for the childhood he never had. He's never been ideologically conservative, uh, that's for sure. He doesn't think ideologically, generally, so you, you can't connect him directly to a consistent ideological point of view. For someone who always walked a fine line when it comes to legality, Trump is a fierce defender of law and order, when a female jogger was left for dead in Central Park, he made political capital out of the feelings of appalled New Yorkers. And when suspicion fell on a teen gang from Harlem, he called for the death sentence, backed up with ads in the press. The gang were given long sentences before being proven innocent of the charges. He talked about the group uh, were guilty and he described them in uh, rather harsh terms. And when they were proven innocent through DNA sampling, he still said that they were guilty and still used his, his intemperate terms. The kids up in, in Harlem were actually smeared by, by Trump. Meanwhile, Trump shared the cheerful optimism of the Reagan couple and unabashedly cozied up to the victorious right wing they embodied. Nancy and Ronald were two interlopers from Hollywood who had mastered politics as spectacle. Image, glamour, celebrity. This was a cocktail that led to power. Even in a more vulgar version, it was bound to work. Well, we can make some connections, I think, to, to Ronald Reagan. He was a leader who appealed to the average person, let's call them that the truck driver in the Middle West, the hairdresser. They were called Reagan Democrats. I think Trump connects with, with, with that group. Yet only Larry King took him seriously and gave him the opportunity to voice his opinions. Japan is a money machine. Saudi Arabia is a money machine. Kuwait, these are money machines, the greatest ever created. Why aren't these countries, these wealthy money machines, paying us for the defense of their freedom and their nations? And these are the countries that in 24 hours they'd be wiped off the face of the earth if it weren't for America. It's ridiculous. Meet the new governor of Minnesota, the surprise winner, wrestler Jesse Ventura. 
This athlete come showman applied to politics the same rules as in his day job. Lots of play acting, saber rattling, and brutal smackdowns. Trump found this a fascinating lesson. There's a long-standing American passion for the rogue, the renegade, the character, uh, people who are coming f to the political system from a very different walk of life and who are speaking truth to power. Trump had a great deal in common with Jesse Ventura. The conspiracy of the elites against the ordinary guy, a raging desire to upend everything, the humiliation of being laughed at by Washington. He doesn't care for the cold weather, so to get him here in, in Minnesota cold weather is a triumph indeed for us. There's a big difference between creating wealth and being a member of the Lucky Sperm Club, which a number of different people that are right now running are. If people think that I'm running, we do great. If I do decide to do this, which I very well might, Jesse's support would be very important to me. Trump was very tempted to be on a presidential ticket with his new friend. But given that Jesse was as shady as him, and outside of Minnesota, a pair of fairground monsters ran the risk of not getting further than the daytime talk shows. I'm not going to be running. The party is, as you know, self-destructing. Uh, Jesse has left, and that's a problem. And so I will not be running. Those options, in your opinion, do not include a run for the presidency or the vice presidency? Right, this year. It may include something in the future, but at this point, here we the go with this flirtation again. No, okay. well, no? I'm just, I'm just saying that in in a number of years, I might consider it. Then Trump's parents died within a year of each other. Fred had Alzheimer's, while Marianne was gripped by a melancholy that swallowed up her remaining memories of life. Strangely, Donald never talks about them. Donald Trump had spent half a century organizing his life and creating a character in public that was essentially a celebrity. He has always been addicted to his clippings, the, the articles about himself. He marks them up with a pen. He sends the comments back to the editor, back to the writer, uh, whether they're good or bad comments. He's always craved the respect of the New York Times, and he's always felt that he never got that respect. So he's always been at once a great critic of the Times and wanting desperately to please the Times and get on its good side. Since he was stuck on the gossip pages, why not go all the way? There was always Playboy and its pliable playmates. This was not a hard step for Trump. He was a fan of Hugh Hefner, who had made a fortune with his little bunny and his big girls in a state of undress. Overall, it was even more effective than the big newspapers, which looked down on him. And then along came this television program, The Apprentice, that put him into American living rooms, made him the big boss, the guy at the conference room, the, the man with this fancy apartment, with planes, with, with helicopters with his name on them, practically Louis XIV figure of enormous position and uh, luxury and opulence and power. Trump had gone bust several times, but in the mind of the average American, that made him the kind of businessman who was always ready to start over. The format for The Apprentice involved shutting up 20 ambitious young wannabe entrepreneurs in Trump Tower, and the boss, Donald, decides which one is the killer worthy to work alongside him. And the show was very popular. Everyone knows watching it that it's not really real, but it, after about a minute and a half, everybody forgets that and thinks that it is real, that this is a real conference room, that this is really happening, that this is just real life. The show was a huge hit across the whole of the United States. In schoolyards and in the workplace, people mimicked Trump's catchphrase, you're fired. Trump had pulled it off. He had become the big bad boss who keeps everyone entertained, the man they love to hate. Trump with his finger of God, you know, you're fired, was very commanding and very dramatic. And I think this really elevated his stature to being somebody who could just take charge of the country and really 
get rid of all the mess and figure out who are the good people. He's going to sit in the White House and the Oval Office, and it's going to be the same thing. He'll know what to do. But Trump was approaching 70. The clock was ticking. The apprentice had conferred a miraculous impunity on him. There was no time to waste. As he said in one of his rare moments of self-insight, he could go out on Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody, and it wouldn't affect Americans in any way. The hour of vengeance had come. Trump was going to rid those who had lost out in the American dream of their persecutors. The Clintons, who made out they were friends and who were always condescending while profiting from power to get rich. Barack Obama, black, African, and Muslim, who pandered to lefty intellectuals. Did Trump believe the rhetoric he spouted? It makes no difference. It isn't necessary to be a politician to become president, and it isn't necessary to have come from the intellectual elite to become a president. Ladies and gentlemen, I am officially running for President of the United States, and we are going to make our country great again. <laughs>